I think we got to get rid of the negative tropes and associations and and just kind of be just be practical you know it's not going to kill you to be practical it might kill you to be impractical welcome to the thriving musician podcast where you go backstage with certified financial planner spencer list to hear stories of how musicians make sound financial decisions on the path to artistic freedom and insights from industry professionals on how to level up your finances career and art Here's your host, Spencer List. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Thriving Musician Podcast. Today, I have a special guest in Mark Edingoff. He grew up in the western suburbs of Philadelphia. He excelled in math, music, and humor, a self-humorist, a self-proclaimed humorist, moved to New York for college, and was swallowed whole by his passion for expressing himself through music, collaboration, and recording. And his life is very interesting. You should read his bio. We'll, I'll put it in the show notes, and I'll ask him to expand. But he's moved a lot of different places, had a lot of different experiences, and now finds himself in the financial world, similar to me. So we have that in common. Um, so I'll let him tell his story, but welcome, Mark. Hey, thank you for having me, Spencer. It's a pleasure being here. Um, love the podcast. Uh, I've shared it with friends and, um, and a couple of them have really dived into it on a regular basis. And I think it provides a lot of, you know, valuable insights and perspectives to musicians, non-musicians, industry professionals um but yeah thank you for the kind words and i am indeed a self-proclaimed humorist uh especially these days as a new father um my genre is dad jokes as uh you know my approach tends to be sort of uh can't stop won't stop you know with regard to those but as far as, uh, yeah, our mutual connection with music and uh, kind of the, uh, as financial professionals um, at the moment, I, yeah, I'd like to tell you more about that. Um, I never really set out to be a professional musician. I mean, in full disclosure, uh, my intent was always to kind of just stay interested in my life path, you know, sort of like, it's funny that you bring up the bio because I have a friend that's always saying, you know, I, I, I choose to live my life in such a way where, you know, one day I will be able to write an interesting bi biography about it. And I think the biography that I wrote, it's, you know, I, it came about because I, for some reason, I had a, a profile on All About Jazz. I guess I was, I don't know how that came to be, but because um, I, don't, I don't know that I'm on tons of jazz records that are sort of uh, propped up in that circle, but I must be on at least one. And I, was, I received an email uh, saying that you, have, you still haven't updated your bio. And I was like, oh, okay. I think part of it was being on this, sh you know, being on the show and writing the bio for you. And uh, I felt like there was some expansion to do there because uh, I think I just responded to, to your question, you know, early on, uh, I think amidst a lot of other responsibilities. So mm -hmm. um, in the practice of sort of like sharing more these days, you know, part of our job is content creation. So uh, I, I think I just sort of was starting to find a bit of a voice as a, as a writer or a, sometimes it feels like a copywriter and, uh, you know, I received that email and I just took it as an opportunity to just sort of like, uh, in kind of like somewhere in between an autobiography and a mockumentary, I guess was my approach to the whole thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, you know, sort of, uh making up for the sort of my lack of of uh 
you know, maybe like sort of uh, the type of jazz credentials that are um, really at the center of that world these days. Um, I just thought it was funny that this website was asking me to write a bio. So I figured I would have fun with it. Um, but yeah, so, um, and as I warned Spencer before this, brevity is not my forte, but you know, I'll try to, I'll try my best to stay on point here. But, um, so I kind of just, you know, came up playing music as, as most young musicians do. Uh, you know, I heard music on MTV and, you know, bands like Nirvana just kind of hit me hard and, uh, you know, and I was interested in playing music, not just listening to it. Um, and I think when, you know, when I went to, I moved to New York City for, uh, for college, I kind of just, I didn't set out to, to be a musician or whatever. I never thought like, okay, now I'm going to figure out how to be a musician, uh, a working musician, this or that. I would just kind of had these sort of dumb luck encounters with people throughout my life that I thought were interesting. And mm -hmm. um, they would ask me to do things or vice versa. And, you know, there I was in New York coming of age, um, just sort of having my mind cracked open and being, uh, and part of that was like expressing whatever was going on there through, through music. And, it's always been a great way to, to build community and in the process, you know, since then, I mean, there's been different chapters of my life musically, but I've, I've been fortunate to, you know, be able to, uh, tour through 30 States, five countries and play alongside heroes and, you know, a couple of big name artists. Um, and you know, play everywhere from Slab City to Meow Wolf, you know, uh, which has been, it's been a, a fun ride. And, you know, as far as uh, the transition into the financial services world, you know, again, it's as a lot of my music, musical experiences sort of took place, I was, uh, just another situation where I stumbled upon it and I can sort of get into that story a little deeper um, if you'd yeah, like absolutely. now or later, but yeah, yeah, let's do it. I mean, basically kind of like the last, like really sort of abundant yes period as a musician was when I was living in Santa Fe, New Mexico um, from what was it? 2013 to 2020, uh, seven years. And you talk a lot about artistic freedom, and I, I definitely want to highlight a lot of uh, my experiences in that period that sort of led up to my sense of artistic freedom at that time and sort of developing a voice. I think up until that point, I was, you know, more in sort of this kind of mode of absorbing from the projects I was a part of and sort of finding myself uh, as an artist, as a musician, and, you know, moving there started, I started, I was fairly isolated, as many are when they move to a new city, and I didn't actually know much about the city. I moved there because my ex-girlfriend at the time uh, her father worked for the National Park Service, and they would kind of pick up and she would call herself a park service brat because, you know, part of the lifestyle is similar to like if you're in the army or something and you kind of move around every couple of years to different, at least that's what that, that's what he would do. Maybe that's what they like to do. They would move to all these like uh, cities and areas with national parks you know they lived in like the great smokies and like wow. staten island and then they went to to live in pecos so initially we had we were living we met in philadelphia and we were kind of vaguely thinking of moving west and we had a cat mookie and we decided to we kind of like 
they they offered to cat sit while we were kind of like sort of vaguely exploring uh the unknown of the continental united states and um we just kind of kind of ended up settling down there for for a moment and uh didn't i didn't really know much about the city i had toured through there at one point you know when i was 20 what was it 20 2011 i was that's when i was really like i was in this uh kind of rockabilly americana band that was pretty active on the touring circuit that was probably like my quote unquote working musician phase um that i sort of just stumbled upon uh, the band was like it was influenced by largely by like Django Reinhardt and Chuck Berry and like rockabilly style aesthetics, I guess you could say. Um, and it was an interesting band because it was, it was, you know, had a full album of original music uh, that we were promoting and, you know, playing, but also like we could, a lot of the musicians in the band were like working musicians in New York city that were, you know, in the trad jazz communities or like kind of like early rock and roll sort of like groups. And so we all sort of knew how to, you know, accommodate different types of environments. So we could play like kind of like bar gigs, entertaining, dancing people, you know, playing, I wouldn't say it, definitely it wasn't, didn't feel like a cover band, but it was, uh, you know, we could play like a lot of like jazz standards or kind of like, um, you know, different types of, um, different types of, uh, music from, from various canons, various lineages, lineages, if you will. And, you know, so we we had gigs we were playing for like at VFW halls, you know, in in the south, or playing for like art school kids in the you know northern California. You know, we could really speak to a lot of different audiences, which was that was really the cool thing about it. You know, there was just sort of every man interest in it, every every person, uh, and that was like my rite of passage as a, as a quote unquote working musician. That's what brought me to Santa Fe originally. <laughs> that's what, that's what all that was about. Again, brevity is not my forte, but yeah. So in Santa Fe, like when we moved there, it was, we were fairly isolated. You know, when you move to a new city as a couple, it can be sort of hard to branch out, you know, cause you're, you sort of have like a lot of your needs met, you know, you're, you could be sort of insular and um i didn't really meet a lot of people like i found a job in the service industry like again i was you know wasn't like okay i'm i'm going to move to santa fe and i'm going to you know be a career musician this or that um so i just started making music in isolation and you know, releasing it on SoundCloud, sort of like in obscurity or or whatever, you know, just kind of like releasing it amongst friends or like online. And eventually I started to meet people. I think I, I met my, my, my friend, I was, I met a friend of mine, Baron, because he worked at a soup place, you know, where they sold soup, really good soup. And I was delivering pizza and we just kind of made this barter. And then I, you know, pizza for soup. I, you know, eventually we started, we decided we would, we would play um, some music together. And then I, I met his roommate, Jacob, and we started a band cult tourist. And, and that sort of like, kind of like put me on the scene. And I wasn't even really aware that there was a scene there. You know, when you move to Santa Fe, if you don't have a lot of like, I mean, I knew it was like an art community. Um, you know, there's a kind of a, this was like before Meow Wolf was a thing. I mean, Meow, Meow Wolf was a thing. It was a small art collective. 
um, but it wasn't like what it is today. Um, for those that aren't aware, it's like a started as an art collective, but um, the collective like received a large investment from George R. R. Martin. And uh, I think it was like a million dollars to convert a bowling alley into an immersive art space. And then they, they also put a music venue in there. It's really cool. Um, very unique thing uh, at the time. And it, you know, so that's like sort of when the art community, that was like sort of like when the younger art community sort of, sort of like had a foothold outside the city, you know, sort of established itself in that foothold uh, versus like it was more known for kind of like, a, a, like, you know, kind of like the Canyon Road art gallery scene, sort of like the classical art gallery type scene uh, before that. So that's sort of like what I thought I was headed into. And there's a lot of retirees there, you know, elderly folks. And just didn't have a lot of like expectations really like mm. so but people say that the city is like or i don't know if they say it but i say that it's it's sort of like you know it's like a manifestation portal or something not to sound too uh you know sedona arizona <laughs> i mean it's you know it's a new new agey place and, and that kind of rubs off um I love new agey stuff. So, you know, my partner, Haley and I, we talk astrology all the time. You know, it, we have lots of m very measurable results to, uh, you know, sort of like clarify the, the truth behind everything we discuss. Um, a lot of scientific, rigorous scientific research as well. Now I'm dad joking, but there's a, it's always funny to bring up astrology in the financial services world. It's uh, you got a lot of quick smirks there, but I think as anybody that's interested in like human archetypes or, you know, it's, it's a fun, at least a fun thing to think about, you know, like, um, so yeah, I think, you know, playing with cult tourists sort of kind of, got me noticed in the scene and i think another advantage i had there versus like a, a larger city was as a jazz musician you know someone that sort of like came up playing i think you know when i was in new york i was playing in like a lot of rock and experimental type bands and i was sort of like cutting my teeth in the like as a jazz musician a little bit like trying to be a jazz musician like trying to absorb that I wasn't like a jazz major uh, and I didn't feel very like welcoming vibes from the jazz majors to be honest with you so I sort of just like did my own thing outside of that world although I did play with some jazz combos at NYU where I went to school and uh, met a lot of you know kind of expanded my network through that um, but so cult tourist is sort of like establishing itself in the in the scene and then i started to get a lot of you know people asking me to do other stuff and it was a cool time because it was all just music that i loved playing like and there was no concern with like i have to pay my bills with these like this show money or or like these like uh tour proceeds like because i had this i found this sweet part-time gig uh at this weird pizza place um that was a lot of other artists and musicians work there so that that actually was like a great way to network as well um i got asked to be in some bands i probably would have never played in. like i would play bass in a death metal band you know at one point uh which was really cool all my all my homies at the the pizza place you know uh we kind of came up together working in this crazy pizza place uh very like rock and roll type of vibe there um but really interesting place next to the oldest house they call it the oldest house in the continental u.s uh, in santa fe but yeah i think it kind of brings up a lot for me about 
you, you, you talk about this idea of artistic freedom, which I think is really interesting. And I think there's a lot of approaches to that and a lot of different ways of thinking about that. But for me, I think it was, it was, uh, I found the most artistic freedom in this time, you know, because it was very simple. Life was very simple, like minimal living. I wouldn't say totally masochistic, you know, I, I mean, I, 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 I hear a lot about the fire movement these days, you know, like, mm -hmm. which is a financial independence, retire early. Mm -hmm. And the, you know, and it's a lot of people sort of like living as minimally as possible, you know, with this idea of like, kind of like hitting a retirement goal earlier in life than most, whether that's 10 years earlier, or 20. Mm -hmm. I guess it, it all depends about how you plan it. But for me, it was like living simply, you know, my rent was the most I ever paid. I, I think up until like I moved to Philadelphia, moved back, you know, after um, my partner and I conceived and, and uh, had our child, um, Sam, you know, our, my living was, was, was fairly, uh, um, yeah, like fairly minimal. I never paid more than a thousand dollars in rent, you know, sometimes as low as $500 in rent. And it's not always easy to do these days, but it's possible. It's harder in big cities, but I, I get like, so the advantage that I had in Santa Fe in general was that it was like what I say about it is like it's it has um kind of like big city cross big city uh cultural currents moving through it um but it feels like a small town which is cool you know like that was a really you know you can like drive anywhere in like 10 minutes or something and also you know, certain parts of the city are very pedestrian friendly as well. Mm -hmm. But I, yeah, I would just, I mean, I remember when I was working at the, the pizza place, I would just, I was doing some very primitive financial planning in my head. Mm -hmm. You know, I would, I would make a lot of cash, you know, over the weekends. And I would always like on Monday, I would, I would just put $200 into the ATM. And, you know, between that and like the, you know, kind of biweekly checks, like I, I, I was living plush, you know, flush, 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 um, not plush, maybe flush. I felt flush, you know, it's all mm -hmm. about how you feel, right? It's mm -hmm. like you're living your artistic freedom or like there's that the guy on Netflix who has the show, like live your rich life mm -hmm. um, or like, I will make you rich. Mm -hmm. Right. I think, I don't know exactly what it's called, but I think his idea is like, like def you have to define your rich life. Like, what does that mean to you? Right. Mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily mean you're like driving a Bentley um, or like you bought your yacht from an oligarch, you know, it's like uh, you're, you're doing the things that give you a sense of abundance in life, you know? Mm -hmm. And for me, that was like having like, I think time and energy is like our most valuable resource. So the more of that, that I have, the more abundant I feel, you know, obviously you need to like pay your bills and, and anxiety about money stress will get in the way of, of, um, you know, anxiety about money stress will, will get in the way of sort of the sense of artistic freedom. But, you know, for me, that was, that was like the, the best period of my life in terms of like having that sense of artistic freedom. You know, it wasn't always like stress-free. It was, it was like kind of like 
a passionate period of life, you know, where, you know, the future wasn't always set in stone. I mean, when, it, when is it, you know, but it was, I met a lot of interesting people and I, more or less kept just kept doing stuff kept doing things that that kept me interested and i've always embraced anything that can keep me learning or facing my fears you know whether that's musical or non-musical if that's like a job or a gig or a project that's sort of like my modus op operandi um with whatever i do in life is it interesting like can i learn can i grow so uh the lifestyle my lifestyle changed a lot when we moved to philly because it's sort of like the i don't know comedian dave Chappelle. he had some joke about like he's like i would i'd be happy living in a cardboard box but you know like but i want to you know i want to be in a relationship with a woman or you know like i or you, you want to have a family like you got to sort of like up your standard of living at some point mm -hmm. and for me that involved you know i mean so it's actually an interesting story like how i arrived at financial services i mean there's so basically like santa fe like things are i'm saying yes to everybody because there's so many interesting creative people there and i've always just like i've always wanted to play in punk bands you know I, I played a lot of like jazz and cerebral music when i was in my 20s you know i was really kind of like pushing for that you know i wanted to have this sort of like dignified artistic output or this or that not that like other types of genres aren't dignified um but you know i was just had this sort of like more stoic serious type of vibe towards music um you know i was into avant-garde new music and then i sort of like when i went on tour with um it was with with the rockabilly band it you know it was fun to make people dance again just to do something basic and get people like you know playing for drunk people or whatever you know i mean it, that gets old too but it was it, in the beginning it was like a nice like palate cleanser or something or change of pace uh but it evolved you know like yeah it just sort of like opened up my sensibility a bit more like i'll say yes to different types of projects that i wouldn't have said yes to in the past like as long as like the people are interesting if we have good conversations like i don't care like how it looks on paper you know like it how it looks on my resume like it's not about that it's about like you know like it's not about like something i can name drop someday you know it's really just about like is this cool like does it feel good and that was that was essentially like what propelled me in that period and then eventually like you know it got to the point where i was kind of spread thin i mean i like it there's seventy thousand people in santa fe versus like i don't know how many million in philly these days i mean last i checked probably like what two to four million new york city a whole other beast you know houston dallas other beasts as well you know you're, that's your neck of the woods right and so i was in an advantage because there wasn't it wasn't as saturated with like drummers you know i'm that's my first instrument um so i was like asked to do a lot because i was like a good drummer and you know relatively approachable fellow i guess you know and I got asked to do some some projects. You know, I was putting out music and people were hearing it and uh and it kind of just started to snowball, which is sort of what happens 
you know, at different periods in life, you know, you're not really expecting things to happen in the way that you think. And then generally like you'll have these sort of like abundant snowball periods. Uh, I think my, my friend, Laura, Laura Ortman, she's a, she's like an avant-garde violinist, this all around cool person. Um, lives in New York city. Uh, but I met her in Santa Fe and she had a good piece of wisdom that she dropped. Like she, she told me, you know, she was like telling me like, Oh, I, I'm, I played, I played with like Greg Sonier from deer hoof. Like, I'm like, what? He's like my hero, you know, like, uh, and she was like, her thing was like, you never ask to be in people's projects. Like they ask you, you know, like you let them ask you, like, you just like do your thing and don't ask, you know? And that kind of stuck with me because sometimes there's sort of like a, people can approach music, like music careerism or professionalism in this sort of like, you know, I don't want to sound judgmental, but like maybe like more of a, like a type A approach or something where you're sort of like, you're, you're banging on doors, you're out there pounding the pavement, you're, you know, like, Hey, I'd love to be in your project, but that doesn't, you know, people want to, in general, I think people like to do things that are their idea. Right. So it's like, if you share something with somebody that inspires them and then they have an idea like, Oh, this person would be cool to work with. That's really, um, that's sort of like when, when that's abundant stuff started kicking in in that period. And, you know, from there, you know, it just snowballed into like these seven projects I was working in and I loved it, but I started to notice that like, there was a, something happening with like, it was like taxing my, my body and like my energy, my time, things like that. Like. I was uh, in a rehearsal with the death metal band Street Tombs. And we used to have these like pretty grueling rehearsals where it was, I mean, they were fun. We were, they were really fun guys. Like we would just, metal musicians are, they're not scary. They're just goofballs, you know, in a, you know, despite the exterior, you know, and the obsession with death. Um, we would have these rehearsals that were like three hours long, like two to three times a week. We'd just be drilling riffs and playing songs and albums start to finish. And it was like pretty intense, you know, and a lot of it's like rote memorization playing. Um, and one day I started to notice like my arm, my left arm going numb, you know, like, and I'm playing a lot of like stuff in a low register, you know, the low, the low string, you know, the D string or the, however you have it tuned down. Um, and, you know, I mean, I've, I've had scoliosis my whole life, you know, since going through puberty and, I always knew it would kind of catch up with me at one point, but I knew that like, just like this lifestyle of like touring around and like logging gear and it didn't seem like it was entirely sustainable. And I was just sort of getting burnt out on being like going on tour was like not as fun as it was when I was in my late twenties you know, you sort of develop these little crutches in life that you need, you know, I need to like, I don't know, whatever it is that you, you need to do to feel like a functioning sort of like grounded individual. Um, it was more difficult to do that. Like, you know, I went on a tour with my, with this band microdoser that I was in, that was a really fun band. It was like sort of a, we called ourselves a helium punk band, but it was a, we went on 
we went on tour and we played with the uh, the X-Bats. They're like a Burger Records band. And we recorded a record with Matt Rendon in uh, Tucson, Arizona on the final day of the tour. And I hadn't slept the entire tour. Like, like, I don't know what's going on with me in my brain where like, I'm just like not sleeping, you know, granted, like, you know, maybe one of the members, uh, I don't know. There was, yeah, there was just some, no, there was something. Yeah. I was having trouble sleeping on that tour. Maybe, maybe somebody was snoring. Maybe not. Maybe, I don't know, but and I started to kind of like get sick and I, I, it's possible I had COVID or something before it was a thing. I don't know, but I just, I had these, like, I was on that tour and I just remember like, it was a wild tour. I mean, we played, I remember getting sick in Slab City, you know, of all places. We were playing a show at Slab City. I don't know if your listeners are aware, but if you haven't, you don't know about slab city it's a very interesting place you know the southwest has a lot of like off the grid living communities and this is like one of the more famous ones there's a um so it's basically kind of like this outlaw community um that kind of governs itself and you know people move there for various reasons but there's a lot of like creative people there. there's a lot of like sculptors that make art with found objects and and they have this venue there where they have like all these like interesting like there's like all this there's this one kind of like this uh death metal musician from mexico that was singing these wild songs about bipolar disorder you know with like backing tracks and uh there's some interesting folks that were truly on another wavelength and uh, you can you can watch a lot of documentaries about it but that's kind of like where i got sick in this pretty like kind of like interesting edgy place and uh we actually we played a gig that i mean we played the show and i think it's on youtube somewhere uh but i was like i was having like death visions in my head i was not feeling well uh and I think it was like the sickness mixed with the lack of sleep, you know, the insomnia. And I think at that point I was just like, okay, like I don't want to like slow down, like all these bands I'm in, like they're going to want to like go on tour and stuff. And I'm, I'm feeling like that's not really what I want to do right now. And I, it's not the only way to like have an audience. Um, and and then the pandemic hit and it's sort of like psh, everything was very like unclear um in terms of like the future of live music and honestly for me it was like a, a bit of like a breath of fresh air just to kind of step away from everything and reevaluate and like that was like in that time my partner Haley and I like we ended up like conceiving our, our son sam probably while watching the walking dead which was oddly prescient you know um it's like bringing a child into a sort of like apocalyptic world or something um but yeah we she'd gr grown up in new mexico and she wanted to like try something else and we we had a, a baby on the way we we're like maybe we should just like be closer to my family um uh because her her family was in southern new mexico and and she was wanting to kind of like switch it up so we figured we would we'd try the big city thing again and then you know after was sam was born i i kind of fell into this like postpartum like depression type of anxiety depression moment like with um which happens to men too apparently and i think part of what like i you know part of what brought me out of that was just finding a steady job you know like a steady mm -hmm. like nine to five job like and that's when i started working at vanguard just like i had this 
licensed role, like answering phones and helping people with their, you know, brokerage accounts and um, solving their problems, de-escalating their frustrations, et cetera. Uh, but also, you know, got licensed and and was sort of like starting to have this sense of like some kind of career trajectory. Mm. But again, it's not like, I don't know, in this, in the way that I never said, like, I'm a career musician, like, I still, I don't think like I'm a career financial services professional, you know, that's, it's this, what's interesting to me right now. And the, I think it was like, another cool thing about the pandemic was like, when people were, they were given all this money by the government, right? And there was this big um, emergence of like all these Gen Z retail investors, you know, that were getting into like they were, what am I going to do with this money? Some people like bought houses or like put down payments on houses. Other people were like getting into meme stocks or crypto. Um, and I thought it was like cool just to, to see this new wave of like that was inspiring to me because my you know my family like has worked in the financial services industry most of my life and uh it was interesting to see like this sort of like younger generation sort of kind of taking ownership of their financial future and and just there was just kind of this in more inclusive dynamic in the retail investor community and that was expanding um so i thought maybe it'd be interesting to like learn about that world and try, you know, just like try. Cause I was like, with this stuff happening with my body, the changes, like, um, I think I was like, I, I don't really want to like keep working in the service industry. Cause that can be sort of like hard on your body. Cause you're, you're working late nights and slipping on floors, like, you know, maybe like nearly cutting limbs or fingers. One time I like sliced off a big piece of my thumb, you know, just stuff like that. So just like, just like to kind of experiment with different lifestyles. The theme I hear, it was interesting to hear your version of artistic freedom was sort of a period of time. So how has your definition of artistic freedom changed as your life has changed? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I wouldn't necessarily say that I had a definition of artistic freedom back then. I was just kind of doing what it is that I was doing. Um, but I sort of understand it as that now. But I think, I think for me, artistic freedom is about having the time, space, and energy to do to be a creative person and to really like, tap into like your genuine like or you know your own original voice and take chances take risks be vulnerable express yourself like connect with an audience on some level you know and it really hasn't changed that much it's always just I don't like to say like it's compartmentalized, you know, because I think it's, I've tried to kind of, you know, part of like being a finance professional, like, you know, we're creating content and we have to do it in a unique way because it's essentially like an oversaturated market. Um, so you're kind of like honing in on some kind of, voice that communicates information that a lot of other people are communicating in different ways but you're doing it you know in an authentic voice and you're you know a lot of people are using that to kind of connect with a niche audience or what have you so in a way i don't think it's totally compartmentalized in that sense um but you know, I kind of understand the period I'm going through is something similar to the period I was going through when I moved to Santa Fe, like 
sort of like regrouping and just just getting in touch with who I am and sort of just doing whatever it is that I feel like doing and putting it out there and not worrying if it's good or bad, if it's commercially viable, just, just doing it and not overthinking it. To me, that's artistic freedom. When you described the period in Santa Fe, it sounded like bliss. It also sounded, you used the word sustainable earlier, and it did not sound sustainable in the sense that as your life changed, that environment no longer served you. Your body literally was telling you that. So for, I know a lot of musicians who are still in that environment and in that stage of life, they might be feeling, they might think to their own experience, oh, I'm kind of living artistic freedom right now. But when we put the word sustainable, longevity, future, when we, when we throw those words on top of that flame, those don't really go together for me. For me, especially when you're talking about having a family starting, you know, maybe having kids or or buying a home or or getting married or whatever other as life changes, you might not want those things for your future, but there could be other things in life that change that don't allow you to live in this world. I just want to know your thoughts on I don't know what to describe, how I would describe your period those seven years in Santa Fe, you described that looking back, you felt like that was a form of artistic freedom. Yeah, I think, yeah, it, it was definitely a form of like, it's sort of like this, this period where you're almost like manically riding a wave, right? Yeah, things are going good, you're saying yes to everything. And you kind of like, you feel like, like, you feel like you're you're just moving and you're invincible, right? Right. And then one day you're just like, oh, my arm's going numb. What's what's up with that? Oh, like I was playing this, you know, album release show and like I felt this I was grooving hard and I felt this grinding sensation in the back of my neck. That wasn't good. Oh well. Yeah. Yeah, let's right. play the next gig and have a beer or whatever uh <laughs> that's sort of like you just keep going keep going you know just like just walk it off whatever that's that was sort of like i don't know that i think that's just sort of like kind of like different age bracket mentalities mm, okay. approaches you know yeah. and i think i'm just sort of refining that experience or synthesizing it with the, this experience you know and i think i've i think part of doing that now sort of like you know because for two years the first two years of sam's life i was sort of buckled down on like okay like let's let's work this job let's let's learn this new world uh and i'm starting by reconnecting with that period of my life I'm rediscovering that kind of like definitely like the artistic part of artistic freedom, you know, which definitely needs resources beneath it. Right. So I think I was kind of focused on the resources for about two years. And that sort of like allowed me to kind of have a solid ground to then be an artistic weirdo again, you know, mm -hmm. like, yeah, that's, and that's really interesting yeah like you know you kind of manifest things i think sometimes like I, I remember when i was in santa fe i was thinking oh it'd be cool to like if i f was like working and doing a million projects like i was back when i lived in new york and but oh that'll probably never happen but you kind of like plant these seeds that manifest you know and i think that's kind of where i'm at right now like i'm sort of like manifesting the next projects planting the seeds and just waiting you know but being active you know it's like somebody said something interesting about making content the other day 
where, you know, in the financial world, we talk a lot about compounding returns, you know, compounding interest. And it, there's something similar that can happen, a similar phenomenon in music mm -hmm. or artistic output. You, you put out work steadily, you share it steadily and it compounds, you know, the return on investment, uh, the investment in this case, I think I've, maybe I've shared this idea, but I have, I have this concept of like psychic versus financial returns and they, you know, so I would say like, to answer your question about artistic freedom, like part of it involves like this, this paradigm of understanding this, like, like what is like a psychic, any type of investment involves like investing your time, energy, or money, mm -hmm. and you expect some kind of return on investment, right? So, you know, in the days in Santa Fe, here I, I'm investing time and energy mostly, not really invest thinking of investing in terms of like money, but the return on investment is like the psychic fulfillment, like the fulfillment of your psyche right which is huge it's like that's that's some of the more memorable you know it's like when people invest in a vacation or something there's a very like the emotions that you feel are you know tend to be way more memorable than you know maybe like the emotions you felt the year that you made a hundred thousand dollars or something mm -hmm. you know yeah. like you're for for the first time yeah uh And, you know, so it's like this spectrum of psychic versus financial returns on any investment. So I think for musicians, like one thing I want to sort of impart to younger musicians is like, be conscious of the, this duality here and be, pra you know, there's, you need just kind of be practical about the, the probabilities of like, you know, as musicians, we often compare ourselves to other professions, like, as we have, we you know, other people that are, you know, maybe lead more regular lives, have regular jobs, have regular salaries. And there's a thing that happens where we don't feel like we're real people or something, you know, because we can't do the things that everybody else does. Like there's this nagging imposter, imposter syndrome or something, or like, even like, you don't feel like you're a real musician sometimes, like if you're not making money doing music mm -hmm. or like, you know, so I think being realistic, like I know so many talented, amazing, creative people and a very slim minority figured out how to make money doing it. You know, not everybody cared about it, but, you know, even the ones that, that really went for it, like a very slim minority have like figured it out because it's the probabilities like of that working out in like creative artistic worlds are, are much lower than like, you know, like other career paths. Like, you know, like when I started working at Vanguard, it's like you, you study for the exam, like just do the job and like, you're mm -hmm. making a good decent salary, like pretty quickly, you know, it's not, there's nothing like super mysterious about it. Right. Mm -hmm. So you have to keep that in mind that like the odds are like, it, I'm not trying to be a wet blanket here, you know, but the odds are stacked against you. So don't allow that to kind of like, you know, make you lose sense of like your self-worth or like think you're not enough you know, or allow that to make you feel depressed about your life or where you are, you know, you just have to remind yourself that like, you might be achieving more, the returns on your investment might be more psychic than financial. Yeah. Um, That's well said. And, you know, on, on this podcast, and for me, we're not, I'm not here to tell you how to make money with your music. There's a lot of podcasts and music business gurus and resources out there for people to do that but that's not the point right artistic freedom is what it is for you so 
whether you decide that you want to do that or not is up to you. And I agree that that should have no bearing on how you feel about yourself and your life and whether you're creative or not or musical enough or not. What we do want to talk about is, and focus on is whatever life that you have decided that you want for yourself and whatever, however music relates to that life, that you are setting yourself up for the artistic freedom that you want for yourself. So for for listeners, what would you tell them? What would you want to impart in terms of like, let's go back to this theme of like, I don't know what what to call it, like a this sort of temporary space that we're in where we're doing music, we're saying yes, we're feeling good about where we are. And we think we're invincible. What should those people be thinking about outside of those horse blinders that might be on in terms of maybe risks that they might be subject to or how to think about the future? Like we're not thinking about the future. Well, how should, you know, what should we be thinking about even though, and this is the example of someone who's in this very present state of artistic freedom. What would you say to them? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> to get to that sort of level of like where you you feel like you're you're coasting on a wavelength, you know, maybe there's a abundant sensation or like a yeah, it's a yes period. I think at at that point you need to learn how to use the word no. You know, mm -hmm. you need to kind of you have to be a little more strategic about your time, your resources. You know, and I think maybe that to answer your previous question is like more how I plan to operate from now on just to be very selective about the things that I do and, and who I work with and like what's worth my time. Uh, and, you know, but again, it's all about like, it's sort of like a relationship, like no relationship has like one set of rules. You know, it's all about like an agreement and mm -hmm. sticking to that agreement, right? So I think as a musician that's aspiring to artistic freedom, it's you're kind of coming up with your agreement with yourself. Like, like what's my agreement with myself for this chapter of my life? For me, in Santa Fe, it was like, I need to work this job 25 to 30 hours a week and put away $200 cash a week and like, and, um, you know, also like, save what I, you know, save what I'm getting from my checks, and then I can spend the rest of the cash. Mm -hmm. Okay, like, that's a financial plan that worked, right, for that period. And right now, there's a different agreement, right? And what does that financial plan look like? you know, looks nothing like that, but kind of coming up to the agreement of like what you need to do that allows for that space in life to, to kind of like, a lot of people talk about like feeling creative blocks and this and that, but a lot of times you'll notice maybe you have to make time for these things. You know, you gotta like, it's, our lives get very busy sometimes. It's like, like when you're in a relationship and like maybe you maybe it's not the sexiest thing in the world, but you got to like schedule intimacy or something. You kind of have to do that as an artist or musician. Like you have to I started going to I like to do drawing and illustration for fun. And I started going to this figure drawing class and I, I kind of like hang with this dude from the class and get a beer afterwards. And he has this cool concept of like uh, you go on an artist date with yourself or you go on an artist date once a week, you know, where you, you're doing something that's sort of like, like there's this anchor of like creativity, uh, where you, where you do something like, like this figure drawing class, like it gets you drawing, it gets you like new ideas. And then afterwards we get a beer and we talk about things like we talk about art. We talk about, 
stuff that fuels this process for us. And, you know, we get different pointers from one another. Like that's like the artist date, you know? And then I think the other thing is like one practice that I found tremendously helpful was like, I don't know if you've ever read the book, uh, The Artist's Way. Um, I have not, but I've heard a lot of wonderful things uh, about it. Yeah. So there's this like, I honestly, I haven't read the whole book, but I what I did take from it was the morning pages practice where you kind of get up every morning and you just like write three pages of whatever. Like it doesn't have to be, and it could be like, it doesn't have to be, doesn't even have to make sense. Like yeah. for me, it was like stream of consciousness, like nonsense, which sometimes sounded like poetry, sometimes sounded like therapy, you know, like that was, you know, it, it could be anything. Like it doesn't have to be art. It can be art. You know, it's those kinds of like steady practices are really like crucial, like anchors that I've found like important, but how do you, how do you get them? You have to like carve out that time in your day. Like you need to like have that time. So right now for me, it's like that time is early in the morning or late at night when everyone else is asleep. Fortunately, I'm a night owl. So I get like two hours a night to myself, you know, and I can be free and just, but if I was like anxious about money, like I was like soon after Sam was born, mm. not free, you know, like, and it's all about being adaptable. And I think, you know, financial planning is, is key along the way, whether or not you're working with a financial planner, like you have to be like, you know, thinking proactively about stuff like that. It's like, as a musician, you're, you're kind of like a, an entrepreneur. Like is that something that I wish I would have done earlier? Like I never thought about like marketing or entrepreneurship. I never like framed what I was doing in that way. Uh, but, you know, maybe that would have helped me like in terms of like achieving more extrinsic success with my music. Um, I think. Yeah, it's all about your intentions and, you know, you need to be artistically free. You need time because it's like, I know for myself personally, it's like when I have time, I don't really know what else to do. So that's when I just like create stuff. Like, yeah. I just, that's just, but if there isn't time, you don't carve out that time. It's like, and just wait for inspiration. Who knows, you know? What financial decisions did you and your family make over the last few years? that led to this feeling of, you know, you've kind of relinquished that financial anxiety. I think it's really just like, you know, finding like the current, like my past job and now my current job, like helped with that a lot. Um, <clears throat> it just gave a, gave a sense of structure and, you know, just like steady income. I think that's always sort of been the best way to alleviate financial anxiety is like to kind of like think about your assets versus your liabilities and like what's coming in versus what's going out and and just doing whatever simple calculations you have to do. Mm -hmm. And also just like being proactive about thinking like that, you know, like a lot of people it's not innate to think in that way, right? And, you know, for us, it's, it's just been a constant, like, refinement process mm -hmm. of how we collaborate in that way. And, you know, and for my partner, Haley, it's really important. She, she doesn't want to just like be a stay at home mom, not that there's anything wrong with that. But she, you know, she wants to be out in the world working. She's like a badass photographer um world class and you know we're both just like getting our handle on like we're just finally like planting our feet on the ground so that we can really like focus on that stuff again i think that's kind of common when you're like we didn't really like 
we didn't excel at like uh, family planning. You know, we, we probably should have worked with a certified family planner, you know, the CFP. I'm just kidding. I don't know if that exists. <laughs> but, that should be, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I know, right? I, I thought that I thought out the other day, I was like, that should be a, I guess there is a, usually the family, yeah, I don't know about the connotations there, but we're not going to get into all that. But yeah, I think we didn't really like prepare super well. Like when we moved here, we were like living on savings for a bit. And then, you know, fortunately I found that job and then like Haley found, she found some part-time work that she really enjoyed. And, you know, we just kind of have to like have conversations from time to time and like kind of reorient ourselves. It's, it's a hard thing to talk about in relationships. Like, I mean, money is like, even more taboo than sex, you know, like in general, culturally, uh, there's a lot, there's a lack of a general lack of transparency in those types of dialogues outside and inside relationships. So, yeah. um, constant refinement, you know, continuous improvement. In I asked you before the show, why is financial literacy among musicians important to you? And your answer was wonderful. So I'm going to read it and I'd love to hear your, your thoughts, your expanded thoughts on your own, your own thought. Mm -hmm. You said, I've seen many musicians deal with the challenges of making a living in music by internalizing the stress in unhealthy cognitive distortions that perpetuate negative self-destructive behavior, behavior patterns and self-esteem slash mental health issues. Well put, Mark. <laughs> um, I don't know what else I could say to that. No, it's it's like this. these tropes of like, you know, actually Haley was the one that brought this, that kind of hit me to this idea, but she used to refer to as success blocks. We had all these friends in Santa Fe who were like these like talented, like, obscure genius types but they always just like had this idea that like you know like money was poison and mm -hmm. uh i think there's this sometimes what musicians and creative people do with with that kind of like either conscious or unconscious sense of like the 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 probabilities of like them achieving this, like the dream they had in their head, maybe when they were younger is like pretty slim. So they just, they feel like that's not available to them, you know, to like live like that. Mm -hmm. So they develop this sort of like toxic relationship with it. Like, Oh, I'll never have that. So like, fuck it. I don't, I don't need that. Like, I don't want that. Like, that's not my thing, you know, like, like I'm above it or something, you know, and it becomes kind of self-destructive because you do need those resources to be a kind of functioning person in society that, you know, and, you know, there's an argument that like to be an artist, you don't need to be a functioning person in society. Like I get that, you know, we we like to kind of have pride in our masochistic struggles and and some people harness those for making great art or whatever mm -hmm. but um i do think fear is a good motivator so maybe that's sort of like where that comes from or just like yeah i think I think we got to get rid of the negative tropes and associations and and just kind of be just be practical you know it's not going to kill you to be practical it might kill you to be impractical maybe you'll you'll go out like with a huge grin on your face but you know maybe you won't get to like hang with your unborn child or, or whatever, you know, like, and be like, Oh, glad I stuck around, you know, cause we, had, we, I mean, we, we lost a couple friends. Like it, it gets, it's real. You know, the struggle is real. Like 
struggle is real. Like we had a, um, yeah, I don't really want to like get into it too much, but like we've had some, some friends, like, I mean, a good friend, um, my friend, Mikey, Mikey Ray, he's a super talented artist. Um, he passed away last year, but he was, a you know, he was a salaried artist for Meow Wolf. He like just, and they were paying him to be his true authentic weirdo self. It was amazing. Like Meow Wolf created this like amazing dynamic for people for working artists and you know, but it was like a fast, like scaling business. That was the other side of it. Right. And like, so they were like paying Mikey. He had the most Instagrammed hallway or like Instagram work in the house of eternal returns for a long time. Like check, check out his work. It's amazing. Super funny, like existential humor, sometimes dark, but he would do these like cartoons that were just so so of his his uh voice and he was just always such a huge influence and i was like really lucky to be able to play music with him and just get to know him as a person um but you know he like he lost that salaried position and i think he kind of like it's hard to kind of go from like i mean i you know i don't know i can't like i don't want to speak on like all the dynamics there, you know, of his personal sure. life, but yeah. um, it, it's just hard when you, when you find that sort of like you catch your stride and then it's sort of like the ground is removed from you on some mm -hmm. level. And I'm not saying that's what happened with Mikey. Like I, I wish I had talked to him more at the end, but it, it can be, it can be intense, you know, like when you lose that kind of footing of your resources, like you need those resources to make your art. And like, if you're thinking in terms of sustainability, like, like that's the word we keep using, you know, you're probably like, like a lot of people that are sort of like these kind of passionate all or nothing types, like, like that's a pretty like high risk, high return approach, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's sort of like, you know, in the investing world, it's like speculative investing. Like you're just like kind of going for it because you're just looking to strike gold and like you're not afraid to lose everything. And you do have to take big risks. And I think the people that really like have standout success in music are the ones that aren't afraid to fail because they're taking those big risks. But like to do it sustainably, you got to have the like the ground beneath you to keep making your art you know yeah and you have to make your own ground at some point yeah i mean and the ground can move beneath you but mm -hmm. you know you can rent your ground you can own your ground whatever mm -hmm. uh that's up to you but there needs to be some ground i asked for a crazy but true fact about you and oh you no said... what what did i say <laughs> You said you moved to New York City a week before 9-11. So I want to know more, but I also want to know how it relates to COVID because I know in New York City, especially COVID was really difficult, especially for musicians, right? We have musicians everywhere losing their work and that was a really dire time, COVID for a lot of people, transformative mm -hmm. time. So I'm, when you said that you, this happened to you, it's almost like, kind of been through it but just in a completely different way like i i relate these two in some way that at least that they're traumatic events but i'm curious what that was like for you and and how that experience relates to you know the experience of covid that you had yeah that's a good question so the 9-11 thing was very formative experience for me um you know coming from a fairly sheltered upbringing in the suburbs of philadelphia and then going to college in new york city and just being kind of like smacked in the face with like the the realities of of living in this world and 
as a young person that's coming of age, you know, to kind of witness an event like that, it really makes you like, it throws a lot of question marks in your head. You know, I would say like it led to this sort of like lifelong existential seeking, if you will, um, that maybe was like happening a little bit before that, but it really ramped up after that. Cause not only are you questioning like the kind of social political dynamics leading up to that, event you know where you see these horrific things in front of your face like that you know and you you have this sense of like i think one thing that i felt that i would connect to covid and the pandemic was like life will never be the same after this mm, yeah. you know and there was sort of like new york likes to gaslight you with stuff like that because new york we'll keep going like no, nothing shuts down New York and New York takes pride in that. And like, there was a sense of that with nine 11, like even after the, I'm, I remember I, very well, like on my way to class that day, you know, I'm walking down university place and I see like smoke coming out of like one of the towers and I'm like, or I wasn't sure, like I wasn't sure wh where it was coming from, but it would seem like it was coming from there, some, coming from somewhere in the horizon. And, but here we are like, and there's workers like, you know, loading boxes on and off trucks. Like nobody seems to care. So I'm like, oh, it must just be like a, it's like a fire somewhere, you know, mm -hmm. just one of those fires somewhere. Just another day. Yeah. Yeah. Just like how there's all these like forest fires now, you know, it's like, it's not just another forest fire, but like it, I don't know. It's just like it didn't, it wasn't like it didn't have that sense of like, oh, like alarming urgency until the mm -hmm. second plane hit the. And then I was in a music theory class and I remember my, my professor, Mark Berry, very funny guy, Canadian guy. Um, he, yeah, the department had just walks in and it's like, we just have, we've just heard news that the second, a second plane has hit the World Trade Center. And we all sort of like in silence connected those dots like, oh, this is like, because it just seemed like an accident at first. Um, and I hadn't even really heard much about it, but everybody just kind of like got up like zombies and then walked out of the building. And then it's like total pandemonium on the streets. And we're in lockdown again, right? Like mm -hmm. so that was a unique experience to people in, you know, on the island, Manhattan. We're on lockdown you know like kind of like covid you know where we were students and fortunately they like there was a, a movie theater down the street that was like letting was playing f free movies in that period you know like so i got to see like movies like i saw waking life back then oh, uh wow. that's a good Rich one. richard linklater uh and that was like kind of really fit the bill with all the philosophical questioning, uh -huh. like to see that movie at that time was like, and just to be like, okay, uh, this is going to give you a couple ideas of books to read and like kind of crack your head open, not crack, you know, crack your mind open, expand your mind. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of where that began. And I think, yeah, anytime these these moments these like kind of seismic shifts in life you know that force us to step away from the day-to-day -day grinds mm. they they can be very valuable i mean that's the silver lining of them like they can really help reorient you because when you're on that hamster wheel like you're not really taking stock of you're you're more likely to not be in that planning mindset or mm. like seeing the big, big picture so that's like kind of the dot I would connect there. Yeah. If that answers the question. Yeah. That's really fascinating. And I always ask these questions to guests and everyone has different experiences. And, and that's just one thing. There's so many more things you've experienced in life that has led you to this point and your mind has changed over that period. So maybe another time we'll, we'll go even deeper on it. Um, my last question is, what is your definition of a thriving musician? Yeah, I think it's, it's 
like I said, I think it, it falls in line with that the this idea of artistic freedom. I think a thriving musician is someone that's taking chances with their authentic self and using their music to express that, you know, is is getting rid of the shoulds, but being practical. Right, like the the shoulds are like the impediment to freedom. The practical is like the the ground of beneath the freedom, if you will. Right, and a thriving musician has both. Yeah, well said. Where can listeners learn more about you and or get in touch with you? Yeah, so I guess it depends what they're after, but you know, if if you're after kind of like um I kind of brand myself as a financial lit- musician and financial literacy advocate round the clock financial literacy ad- advocate on LinkedIn, so I'm putting out a lot of content there um really honing in on a voice and trying to keep you know, put out like kind of financial literacy content uh, with like, I guess, like wit, humor, and style in the best way that I can. You can follow me on LinkedIn, connect, uh, Mark Daniel Edingoff, (laughs) E-T-T-I-N-G-O-F-F. I'm not going to make a joke about my last name, but you can make it in your head. It's fine. I went to middle school. but. Um, yeah, if you want the weirdo show, that would be on Instagram, silence at moon, silence underscore at AT, you know, not the symbol underscore moon. Um, also, um, you know, putting out funny stuff or non sequiturs, puns, word, I love wordplay and things like that on my Twitter. Uh, J underscore masochist. Um, and I also have a SoundCloud page that I'm, I'm uploading tracks to under the, under that name these days. And, uh, those are good ways to connect, um, you know, support the message, support the, the, uh, the music, um, share you know, share your music, your message. And then, yeah, I, I think that covers it, you know. Well, with that, I hope you all enjoyed this episode. Feel free to share with another thriving musician or better yet, leave a review on Apple Podcast. And I hope you all have a wonderful day. Keep thriving. Want more ideas, tools, and resources on how to achieve artistic freedom? Read the leading financial blog for musicians at moneymaestroblog.com and sign up for the Financial Literacy Newsletter. Want to submit questions or nominate a thriving musician for a future episode? Fill out the contact form on moneymaestroblog.com and keep thriving. I actually wanted to change that from the 9-11 thing, like to there was like another I, I thought of like it might be funny to just throw some odd jobs in there yeah I, I just wanted to like plug my first job which was uh playing in the fife and drum corps in philadelphia as a colonial reenactor at 12 years old um and yeah thanks to uh my dear first drum teacher hoagie wing and i ended up playing fife and drum music, American revolutionary era, fife and drum music with some real characters. Elliot Levin, if you're listening, um, anybody, yeah. Elliot was a free jazz, like avant-garde sax player. He played with like Cecil Taylor. It was just like a funny, like this like 12 year old me just like playing American revolution music with, with these folks was, uh, was pretty fun and formative.